This is Nightly Business Report with Sue Herrera and Bill Griffin. Learning the alphabet, sales and profits soar at Google's parent company as it remains the dominant player in online ads. Stocks slip as bond yields rise, the 10-year Treasury note is closing in on 3%, and investors are paying close attention. Open house, they're filled with buyers ready to stretch those budgets to make a deal and get in before rates and prices go even higher. Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Monday, April 23rd. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Sue Herrera. My partner, Bill Griffith, is off tonight. It is a busy week for earnings, and we begin tonight with a blowout quarter for Google's parent company, Alphabet. That firm easily surpassed both earnings and revenue expectations, despite privacy concerns. Alphabet saw better pricing on advertisements and made money from its investment in startups. Alphabet earned $9.93 a share, 65 cents better than estimates. Revenue rose 25 percent to more than $31 billion. The stock was volatile in initial after-hours trading. Josh Lipton has more on Alphabet's quarter. Google cites revenue is a key line for investors that refers to the company's bread and butter, the properties that it owns and operates like Search and YouTube. Revenue there did come in at a better than expected $22 billion. B. Riley's Sumit Sinha says that growth is key, especially as the company continues to face competition in many of these areas from companies like Amazon and Facebook. On the flip side, Sinha says operating margins for core Google did come down to 27 percent due to higher expenses a year ago, 31 percent. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Josh Lipton, San Francisco. One of Alphabet's biggest revenue generators is YouTube, but the digital video sharing company is facing a number of challenges. Julia Borston has the details. While Facebook has been the focus of widespread scrutiny for its privacy practices and shortfalls protecting consumer data, Google's YouTube is drawing concerns as well. CNN reporting that ads from 300 major companies, including Amazon, Netflix, and Nordstrom, ran on YouTube channels with offensive extremist content. YouTube responding, quote, when we find that ads mistakenly ran against content that doesn't comply with our policies, we immediately remove those ads. We know that even when videos meet our advertiser-friendly guidelines, not all videos will be appropriate for all brands. But we are committed to working with our advertisers and getting this right. But it's not the first time YouTube has struggled with this issue. To the extent that YouTube can utilize AI to ferret out uh, content that would be unsafe for brands, content that would be kind of um, inappropriate for children, that is certainly something that YouTube is, is working on. It's a tough task, right, because you have right, billions of hours being uploaded to YouTube from all over the world. That's not all. Earlier this month, over 20 privacy and advocacy groups filed a complaint with the FTC, alleging that YouTube illegally collects data about underage viewers, asking the agency to investigate whether YouTube violates the Child Online Privacy Protection Act. YouTube says it's not for anyone under 13, though anyone can watch YouTube videos without an account or logging in. The company has a separate kids app that doesn't collect data for ad targeting. Now, in the wake of the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal, U.S. legislators are looking at broad privacy regulations that would cover Google and Facebook. And Europe is launching more stringent privacy regulations next month. The higher level uh, question is, is whether or not uh, Europe is going to keep after Google and, and Facebook as intensively as it has. We know that Google paid a massive fine last year, 2.6 billion euros. DiClemente says Google and YouTube aren't as exposed to privacy risks as Facebook is due to the nature of search, but the Wall Street Journal just reported that Google has more total user data than Facebook. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston in Los Angeles. Daniel Flax joins us now to talk more about Alphabet's earnings and the quarterly results and what it means for the stock longer term. He is senior research analyst at Newberger Berman. Daniel, welcome. Nice to have you here. Great to see you, Sue. You said you were looking for pretty solid growth in the business. It certainly seems from this report that you got it. I think the report looks solid, Sue. I think the company is executing nicely on their core search business, and they're also seeing continued momentum on the YouTube platform as well as the Google Cloud platform. And so when we think about the, the medium to, to long term for this company, there's several growth engines uh, underneath. That, that we think can help sustain attractive growth rates for some years to come. Such as? 
So what we we can speak specifically to, to some of the growth rates, but when you look at the performance this quarter of, of approximately 20 percent growth, you have um, other assets like Waymo, for example, in their uh, in their autonomous driving uh, program. And so you, you when you put all of these things together, along with the investments that the company is making, we think that there's a significant amount of potential for where they can go uh, over time. So the the results certainly are, are always going to have puts and takes, but we think this quarter demonstrates that they're continuing to execute uh, and, and certainly have a very long-term focus to what they're doing. We should point out that uh, Google's uh, first quarter ended March 31st, and that was a couple of weeks before the Cambridge Analytica uh, story broke. So, so we're not going to see any impact reflected in this particular uh, report. But, Daniel, do they not have to? Does, does an alphabet have to address longer term how they are going to use data collection and explain it a little bit more plainly to their investors? I think they do, Sue. I think it, it is incumbent upon Alphabet and the other platforms to really engage with their users and explain to them how their business model works and provide a level of transparency to the users so that they understand how the data is being used. Stepping back, though, if we think about businesses globally, be it in technology or all the other industries, everyone is trying to gather data and figure out how to deliver a user experience that is both compelling and also enables them to make money. And so we think, and obviously there are regulations that are coming into force in Europe, and we would expect to see more things globally, that all of these companies, and certainly Alphabet included, are going to need to begin to adjust and help people understand what it is they're, they're doing and what it is they're, they're giving away, if you like, uh, in terms of their data. Now, I, I suspect there are going to be plenty of users who, who are comfortable with that, but there could be others who are less comfortable mm -hmm. with that. All right. On that note, Daniel, thanks for joining us. Thank Daniel you, Daniel Flax with Newberger Berman. Well, technology stocks were overall a drag on the broader market, which saw the Dow fall for the fourth straight day. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was off 14 points to 24,448. The Nasdaq was down 17, and the S&P 500 was up just a fraction. It wasn't just the tech sector that investors were watching, but also the yield on the 10-year Treasury, which is within striking distance of 3 percent. So what might that mean for stocks? Bob Pisani takes a look. Will rising bond rates doom the stock market? Not necessarily, but it's causing a little bit of agita. Rising rates impact the stock market because they increase the cost to borrow money for consumers and businesses. For consumers, it translates into higher borrowing costs for things like credit cards and mortgages. Same for corporations. Higher borrowing costs might curtail expansion plans. Overall, it means less money to spend, and it also can mean less profit for corporations. So will a 3 percent bond yield really doom the stock market? Is it that bad? Well, it will certainly lift the rate of return investors expect from stocks. But Bulls insist that with earnings growing 20 percent this year, the expected return may be sufficiently high so that there will not be any shift out of equities, that corporations are going to make enough money to more than compensate for higher rates. And bear in mind that the market has already been adjusting to the prospect of higher interest rates. Utilities and real estate stocks compete with treasuries for investors looking for yield. As treasury yields have risen, utilities and REITs have dropped, with real estate stocks down about 9 percent this year, and utilities are down about 5 percent. And the banks, which generally do better when rates move up, have outperformed the S&P 500 by about 2.5 percentage points this year, and would have gone even better had loan growth not been fairly anemic. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Bassani at the New York Stock Exchange. Dow component Walmart is reportedly close to making a big acquisition. The world's largest retailer wants to spend billions of dollars to buy a major e-commerce company in India. And that could pit Walmart against Amazon. Courtney Reagan has the details. India is the second most populated country in the world, with a retail market valued at nearly $700 billion. Along with China, India is one of Walmart's key growth markets. While it hardly does any business there today, that could be changing soon. The world's largest retailer is reportedly close to spending billions to buy a majority stake in India's largest e-commerce site, Flipkart. The 11-year-old online marketplace has more than 100 million users and 100,000 sellers, shipping more than 8 million packages a month. Customers Walmart hasn't been able to reach because of strict regulations limiting foreign retailers' ability to run big stores in India.
Among other requirements, the Indian government requires big box retailers selling to Indian consumers get 30 percent of the goods they sell from local Indian sources. It's an effort to protect the mom and pop merchants that make up the majority of the retail industry in the country. As a result, Walmart's only business in India is through a wholly owned subsidiary with just 20 wholesale stores called Best Price Modern that sells food, appliances and general merchandise only to other small and medium businesses, not directly to consumers. But e-commerce marketplaces that don't sell their own merchandise but operate a platform for sellers are not subject to the same regulations in India. Since Flipkart operates as a marketplace, Walmart's ownership would allow it to legally sell to Indian consumers. The looser rules for marketplace selling is also how Amazon has grown its Indian business. While its U.S. marketplace is a combination of its own goods and third-party sellers, in India, Amazon is only a third-party marketplace and a big one. Amazon Prime India launched two years ago, and CEO Jeff Bezos says more Prime members joined there in the first year than any other country. There are reports that Amazon is also interested in Flipkart, but experts suggest a deal with Walmart is more likely since Amazon already has a big business in the country and could face regulatory hurdles. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Courtney Reagan. It is time to take a look at some of today's upgrades and downgrades, which includes a number of Dow components. We start with Merck. Goldman Sachs raised its rating on that drug company to buy from neutral and named it to its conviction list of favorite stocks. The analyst cites the potential for strong sales of lung cancer treatment, Keytruda. The price target is $73. The stock rose 2 percent to $60.25. Caterpillar's rating was upgraded to buy from neutral at Citi. The analyst cites improvements in the Chinese construction sector. The price target is $180. Shares of Caterpillar were up fractionally to $153.99. Exxon Mobil saw its rating raised to market perform from underperform over at Raymond James. The analyst there says Exxon's dividend yield is the highest in decades. The firm also sees a decent chance that Exxon will start buying back stock. The stock rose a fraction to 79.57. And Verizon's rating was raised to overweight from equal weight at Barclays. The analyst there cites a better revenue outlook. The price target is $56 a share. The stock was up 1.5% to 48.66. Still ahead, why Alcoa's stock had its worst day in nine years. The Treasury Department is giving American customers of Rusal, that's Russia's biggest aluminum producer, more time to comply with sanctions. The extension was bad news for rival Alcoa, which saw its shares drop more than 13 percent, its worst performance since 2009. Aluminum prices also fell on the temporary reprieve. Jackie DeAngelis has more. In the interest of national security, President Trump has changed the rules for certain aspects of international trade. Earlier this year, Trump imposed a 10 percent tariff on aluminum. The goal? To level the playing field and make it easier for domestic companies to compete with international ones that receive subsidies. His target was China. Next, sanctions on Russian aluminum, specifically a company called Ruzal, because of its association to Russian billionaire Oleg Deripaska who's alleged by the Treasury Department to be involved in a range of illegal activities. Aluminum prices have been fluctuating wildly on all this news, up last week on supply concerns, then down today after Treasury granted more time for companies to wind down their business with Rizal. I think it's the beginning of the end for that rally. I think the U.S. Treasury and the administration realized that they made a mistake. They were not intending to impact the market as they did. So why do investors care so much about Russian aluminum? The metal itself is important because of its multitude of uses, from things as big as automobiles down to the can of whipped cream in your fridge. The top three aluminum producing nations, China, Russia and Canada, in that order. In fact, according to the Aluminum Association, the U.S. currently imports more than one and a half billion pounds of primary aluminum from Russia. 
That amounts to about 12 percent of all demand in the United States. To put that in perspective, that's enough aluminum to make more than 10,000 Boeing 747s. Russian aluminum comes through several major U.S. ports. New Orleans, Baltimore and Houston are the top three. There are some concerns that slowing business there might have an impact on local economies. There's also a concern that higher aluminum prices will cost U.S. jobs as companies that use the product will need to adjust expenses. While the administration wants to take a tough stance on international trade and other issues, it is clear that a balance must be struck so as not to have policies that backfire at home. That's one reason analysts think that Treasury announced it would take longer to evaluate the situation with Resolve. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Jackie DeAngelis. Sanctions on North Korea are also squeezing that country, and that is why its leader, Kim Jong-un, appears to be shifting his focus. Eunice Yoon is in Seoul tonight. The mood here in Seoul is hopeful, with a big summit between the two Koreas coming up on Friday. Over the weekend, we heard some encouraging comments out of North Korea when leader Kim Jong-un said in a policy speech that North Korea no longer needed to test long-range missiles or atomic bombs and would close its nuclear site. Some North Korea watchers here say that an important point out of Kim's policy speech was that the priority in Pyongyang would shift from nuclear deterrence to economic development. To do that, Kim needs relief from economic sanctions that were imposed by the United Nations to compel North Korea to stop pursuing a nuclear program. Those sanctions have started to bite. Even China, North Korea's longtime economic partner, has become tougher, with imports of North Korean goods to China falling 87 percent from last year in the first quarter. Some North Korea experts see this as an opportunity now for South Korea and the United States to make some progress on denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula. However, the White House has indicated that it won't loosen sanctions unless North Korea makes progress on dismantling its nuclear program first. That's why here in Seoul, where people have seen it all before, they're waiting and watching. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eunice Yoon in Seoul. Sales lose steam at Hasbro. That's where we begin tonight's market focus. Hasbro said the bankruptcy of Toys R Us, one of its largest retail customers, impacted its quarterly results. Weaker sales across many of the toy makers' brands also led to an earnings miss. But Hasbro says it sees clearer skies ahead and it reaffirmed its profit and its operating margin outlook for the year. So shares climbed 4 percent to 86.12. A rise in tissue sales helped Kimberly Clark blow past estimates. The maker of Kleenex also raised its revenue forecast for the full year. But shares of Kimberly Clark fell 1.5% to 98.52. ESL Investments, that's the hedge fund run by Sears CEO Eddie Lampert, is interested in buying some of the struggling retailers' businesses. ESL said it sent a letter to Sears urging the company to consider selling several divisions, including its Kenmore brand, to improve liquidity. Shares of Sears jumped more than 7 percent to $3.24. Alaska Air eked out a profit that topped Wall Street expectations while posting revenues that were in line with estimates. Alaska said it plans to improve performance by introducing new passenger fees later this year. Shares soared 5 percent to 69.11. A tech hedge fund manager who made a big bet on cloud management company Box says his investment is paying off. The CEO of venture capital firm Social Capital said the company, compared with its rivals, is likely to profit the most from growth in artificial intelligence. He says the company's retention rates speak for themselves. When you think about how sticky something is, the most important thing to look at is this concept called churn, which is how fast are people leaving the service. And uh, specifically, you can look at companies leaving the service or the amount of dollars that you're losing. And in any of those metrics, Box is phenomenal. It is probably the top decile in terms of its ability to retain customers and grow revenue. And as a result, Box shares jumped nearly 11 percent to $22.91. Well, it's no secret that the labor market is tight. The latest report suggests a healthy job market in favor of job seekers. So if you're looking for new employment, Kate Rogers tells us that you might want to start with the CIA. 
Zachary Wyatt is a retired CIA operations officer. He spent 25 years at the agency and now helps it recruit new talent. The CIA is currently hiring for over 100 specific career tracks. Everything from cyber threat analysts to accountants, from foreign language instructors to data scientists. Wyatt says the CIA's most proactive recruitment efforts are in its directorate of operations. That deals with the clandestine work of the organization. And they are charged with recruiting foreign sources around the world who have access to information our government can't get any other way. Within the Directorate of Operations, salaries typically range from $55 to $88,000 a year for entry-level workers. And new recruits get a lot of training. Training for us provides people the tools they need to do the job. It's not an effort for our organization to determine where the best fit is. We are only training those people we have already determined have the skills to do it. To be considered by the CIA, you need to be at least 18 years old and a U.S. citizen. And most careers within the agency require a four-year degree. The agency is looking for talent across a wide array of demographic and academic backgrounds. They also recruit across the country on college campuses, including Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. The fact that our students are global thinkers, global problem solvers, and the fact that they speak some of the critical languages is very attractive to the employers who work in the intel community. William Bilicic is a sophomore at Georgetown studying international politics and security, minoring in French. Working as an analyst for the CIA or another organization in the intelligence field is among its top career interests. All these great public servants doing amazing work each day just to keep our country safe and keep everyone here and abroad safe, and that's really what attracted me to that field. But the application process for Intel jobs is very competitive, rigorous, and requires patience. There are thousands of applications for these positions, so students who put themselves out there need to understand that they need to have all of their ducks in a row, put their best case forward. The CIA seeks out candidates who are mission-oriented and want to serve. Wyatt cautions it's not for everyone. When you combine what we're looking for, that is interest in public service, not needing public recognition for your successes, not being able to share often some of your successes with the people you most love and respect, that's a sacrifice and it's a lifestyle. We are mission driven and people have to realize that coming in. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kate Rogers in Washington, D.C. Coming up, while bidding wars are the rule and not the exception in this housing market. Here's a look at what to watch for tomorrow. Earnings for several Dow components are on tap. We'll hear from 3M, Caterpillar, Coca-Cola, United Technologies, and Verizon. We'll get new data on how the consumer is feeling about their finances and the broader economy. And the manufacturing sector will be in focus. Data will be released showing how strong conditions are in two areas of the country. Sales of previously owned homes rose more than expected last month. Existing home sales increased 1.1 percent to a four-month high as buyers remain undeterred by the limited number of properties available on the market. Existing home sales account for 90 percent of the market. But as interest rates rise, buyers are trying to get into a home before those rates go even higher. The number of listings is no match for demand, and homes are selling not in days but in hours. Diana Olick reports on the hotter than hot housing market. On a sunny spring Sunday in suburban Philadelphia, families toured a five bedroom house listed three days before at $600,000. It already had two offers on it. The market is chasing the houses. Agent Patrick Clark had shown the house two dozen times already, but kept the Sunday open on just in case. Competition is so fierce that more buyers are jumping at deals and then backing out, hurting the seller. It's incredibly difficult to recreate the sense of urgency that you have a chance to create the first time you go out on the market. So, so we put this on the market Thursday and advertised it that we would not look at offers until Monday uh, just to, to put that strategy in place. 
And the urgency spiked even more this week as mortgage rates stuck in place for a month suddenly moved higher. I think people are realizing that the, the glory days of being in the 3% are, are well over. So people are definitely more concerned now uh, of rates going higher towards 5% and, and beyond. While interest rates are still historically low, home prices are rising very quickly and bidding wars are the rule, not the exception. That leaves buyers with less wiggle rooms in their budgets for any changes to the monthly payment. The mayor family relocating from Florida is getting sticker shock. Being in the budget has been a little difficult. Um, everything has been so far has been pretty pricey, um, whether it's the house itself or the taxes. The combination of higher rates and prices suddenly has more buyers stretching their limits with lower down payments, an option that is only now opening up. You could always put low down payment on um, on lower priced homes, but once you start getting to that five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollar price range, it typically was twenty percent. Where now you can do five percent. So we are seeing that uh, absolutely, especially in, I would say within the past year that, that has spiked up. The only cold water for this hot market would be more homes for sale, but higher rates also mean fewer sellers will want to list and lose the record low rate they already have. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. And before we go, here's a look at the day on Wall Street. It was off on the Dow, 14 points to 24,448. The Nasdaq was down 17, and the S&P 500 was up just a fraction. And that will do it for Nightly Business Report tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. Have a great evening. We'll see you tomorrow.